this one. Okay, so much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you're enjoying your lunch and uh, glad that you could be here for this uh, presentation on George Weiss, uh, his view of Christ as expressed uh, uh, in the Eucharist. And uh, be leading you through this uh, presentation for the next um, you know, 40, 45 minutes or so. And I'm uh, fortunate to have a colleague who's worked on uh, this uh, 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 catechism by George Weiss, uh, joining us uh, from Scotland. So uh, uh, Grant Gabby will uh, uh, make a, a presentation uh, in the middle of this, uh, talking about uh, translation, and then perhaps at the end of this uh, total presentation, you can ask some questions, which have always been good in the past. This is the fifth in a series of presentations. So we need an adjustment here. Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> I think this is, let me go. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. This is the fifth in a series of presentations that uh, have been giving here at uh, the Schwenkfelder Library and Heritage Center on uh, Christology and uh, the belief in Jesus uh, from the perspective of Caspar uh, Schwenkfeld. It first started uh, in September of 2019 with Schwenkfeld, Schwenkfelders and a distortion of Jesus because uh, some uh, uh, scholars, uh, some uh, in the church are wondering about uh, Schwenkfeld's uh, particular viewpoint uh, about Jesus, especially when he uses the word uh, celestial flesh. So I picked this up in uh, September 11th of 2019. But as the study on uh, this uh, topic has uh, developed, uh, I realized that this was could be traced to uh, his viewpoint on the Eucharist. So in November the 20th, uh, 2020, uh, we presented on Schwenkfeld, Schwenkfelders and uh, the Eucharist. What uh, did Caspar Schwenkfeld uh, mean and when Christians partake of the bread and the cup? And then uh, we developed this even further uh, in June the 9th, 2021. But I realized uh, while uh, doing this uh, translation that uh, there's been a, an adjustment within uh, the Schwenkfelder community from the time of Schwenkfeld into uh, the times of uh, the migration and then uh, ultimately to where we are today. So it then led um, us on to uh, the fourth of these, uh, sorry, maybe third again, but the fourth of these uh, to George Weiss. George Weiss uh, is a significant uh, Schwenkfelder um, leader. Of course, he had a, a noteworthy life, uh, but he also wrote a catechism by which he uh, spelled out uh, beliefs for the Christian faith and also has a section on the Eucharist. And we looked at that uh, last time um, uh, that I was here, I believe it was in December. And then uh, today uh, we're looking at George Weiss, his life, his catechism, and his view of Christ, particularly as it's expressed in the, in the Eucharist. So you can see the progression here, starting originally with uh, Schwenkfeld, his view on Jesus, now uh, developing into the Eucharist, and then on to his follower, George Weiss, and his view of Christ, as particularly seen in the Eucharist. So that's where we are today. Who is George Weiss? 
Reverend George Weiss, the first pastor of the Schwenkfelders in the colonies uh, from the 1730s um, and uh, then uh, passing away in 1740. He is a writer, a writer of uh, a catechism. I don't have it uh, here today, but I have pictures for uh, you to see uh, on the screen. He is known as a significant interpreter of Caspar Schwenkfeld uh, and his, his work and his writings. So he's a very uh, key uh, figure indeed. And as we look at this uh, today on, on uh, George Weiss and uh, the Eucharist on Schwenkfeld, I'm going to be asking at the end, in what way were Schwenkfeld's ideas, were they passed along? And then what was his viewpoint of Christ specifically as it's found in this uh, fresh translation uh, by uh, my colleague uh, Grant Gebby on um, uh, George Weiss's uh, Eucharist, uh, George Weiss's uh, catechism and his section on the Eucharist. Some of you might be familiar with a man named Alan Seipt, uh, not Alan Seipt, uh, who uh, I believe still lives in Connecticut. Uh, he used to eat hoagies at my house following youth group, uh, but uh, Alan Seipt, uh, his, uh, uh, his predecessor, who wrote uh, this book on Schwenkfelder hymnology and the sources of the first Schwenkfelder hymn book uh, printed in America, he had this to say about George Weiss. It may safely be said that there has never been a more intensely spiritual Schwenkfelder than George Weiss. And he's writing in 1909. So who is this man, George Weiss? Let's talk about his upbringing, uh, then his education, and then we'll get on to his uh, catechism. George Weiss, born in Harpersdorf, Lower Silesia, Germany in 1687. He came from a family plain and poor, but prominent in Schwenkfelder affairs. His father uh, being a man named uh, Kasper Weiss. Uh, wonder if that name Casper in any way is uh, related to or thought of as Casper uh, Schwenkfeld, uh, per perhaps so, but Casper uh, Weiss, uh, even if uh, his name uh, wasn't uh, uh, brought about through uh, the, uh, his fondness for Casper Schwenkfeld, at least uh, certainly a very important and prominent uh, Schwenkfelder in Germany before the migration. Casper Weiss, a linen weaver uh, by trade, uh, working hard with his hands uh, for much of the day, but uh, consulted frequently on Schwenkfelder beliefs uh, and Schwenkfelder thought in Silesia, Germany. George Weiss's uh, mother, Anna, uh, Anna Anders, uh, the daughter of George Anders of Harpersdorf. In that uh, country, Casper uh, Weiss, uh, quite poor and alone, a plain man, and as the world would uh, consider relatively uh, un unimportant. But it's into this family that George Weiss is born, and he goes on to uh, develop himself uh, sort of like Caspar Schwenkfeld in his uh, thinking and his reading of the uh, Bible and spirituality, and he devotes himself to uh, the study of scripture. So even though George Weiss uh, lives in poverty, he's, uh, he becomes uh, extremely well-educated and well-read. He made ample use of his father Casper's uh, uh, library and consequently became well read and informed in the doctrine of uh, Christian uh, theology and then also in the writings of Casper Schwenkfeld. In his youth, he read uh, through the writings of Schwenkfeld and also other uh, various confessions of faith and even attempted his uh, scriptural studies in uh, certainly in German, his, uh, his uh, mother tongue, but then also in other languages too. So. Uh, yes, you can learn languages, even if it's not your mother tongue, and even if uh, you can even do it on your own, perhaps an encouragement for some of us here today. In his secular education, he became proficient in the biblical languages, in Hebrew and Greek, and in, uh, also in Latin, and he used these uh, to his advantage in uh, giving uh, language instruction, which he will eventually pass on to other Schweinfelders too. He began writing. At uh, age 13, he had copied uh, a postille. How many of you have seen a postille? Okay, a few of you probably have handled these uh, here in the, li uh, in the library. Uh, collections of sermons uh, throughout to the church here. Uh, by age 13, he had already uh, copied some of these over. He had a natural gift for writing uh, and uh, the writing of poetry, but he never received uh, any training in the art of poetry. I think it's fascinating because uh, he's also a writer of hymns. If you know George Weiss, he composed many hymns uh, for the Day of Remembrance, uh, composing one each year for his, um, 
in his uh, six, seven years uh, before uh, he went on to glory. His writing skills uh, influenced others such as Christopher Schultz and uh, then Christopher Schultz too would go on to write a catechism uh, like George Weiss. George Weiss transcribed the Schwenkfelder hymnal and he helped his father with this. The hymnal consists of uh, some 874 hymns. This is a diligent, diligent person, a self-learned uh, man who learned from uh, his uh, family who lived in poverty. It's really a, a, an amazing, amazing story. His role in the migration, this is George's uh, role in the migration, uh, grows uh, substantially within the Schwenkfelder community. So you know, the Schwenkfelders uh, made their way into Saxony in 1726. It was during this period that um, interested youth like Christopher Schultz uh, came to Weiss uh, for language instruction. So he started uh, passing along his uh, language ability uh, during 1726. He learned to expound the scripture and discuss uh, difficult matters. And he was called upon to teach the children, which is, I think, very significant for his catechism because this uh, book, which is about yay thick or so, was written for the children. So it starts uh, in his uh, mind's, uh, mindset in 1726 uh, to start uh, to write a catechism. It'll come about um, into fruition uh, several years later. George Weiss uh, migrates uh, to uh, this area, Philadelphia in 1734. Uh, some of you will know in the story that on the day that uh, he landed uh, in Philadelphia, uh, he buried his wife uh, and then uh, led in the very first uh, Gedeckness uh, Tag service. George Weiss is in Pennsylvania through, for the rest of uh, his years, 1734 to 1740, but uh, uh, recognized as a significant leader among the Schwenkfelder uh, community. It is the nine uh, uh, house churches that uh, elect him to be Forstera uh, in charge of conventicles and religious instruction of children. He's uh, completely uh, uh, intertwined with Gedeckmistag, uh, where he writes uh, special hymns uh, each year on uh, the observance of the migration. He's a teacher of Schwenkfelder youth and Schwenkfelder adults, teaching them uh, Schwenkfelder principles, but also uh, Christian theology and doctrine. He writes his catechism and then influences people such as Balthazar Hoffman. I'm sure I'm Heard of Balthazar Hoffman? Oh, yes, okay. As well as Christopher Schultz, who I mentioned earlier. And then he's uh, somebody who is uh, functioning as a, as a pastor, helping uh, people through um, milestone uh, uh, times in their lives, uh, whether it be marriages, uh, whether it be funerals. Uh, he is a pastor, he is a catechizer, he is a teacher, uh, and he is a leader for the Schwenkfelders. How many of you have seen this slide before or seen uh, these pictures uh, before? This is where George Weiss is uh, laid to rest and uh, this is in the Southern Meeting House uh, Cemetery. Uh, you know, his name you'll see on the, on the large um, uh, slide here. And then his uh, stone is uh, on the right of the slide. Now, let's move on to uh, his catechism, uh, what is involved with it, uh, what is the overall framework of it, and then we're going to get to specific questions on the Eucharist and specific questions uh, that draw out uh, George Weiss's opinion on the person of Christ in the Eucharist, which is where this uh, these series of brown bag lunches uh, has been um, uh, been developing in its, in its source. So here's the catechism written and uh, prepared by George Weiss uh, beginning uh, 1726 in his mind, 1733 as he puts it on paper and continues into Pennsylvania until 1740. And he uses these uh, questions and answers for young people. Let's turn the catechism sideways and you can see how thick it is. That's pretty thick, not light reading. Uh, it's not Reader's Digest, is it? No, not at all. Uh, on the preface uh, page, uh, it says its contents included the entire orthodox and thorough doctrine concerning God's, God's counsel and will for the salvation of mankind through Christ and the Holy Spirit, according to the content of Holy Scripture. 
And if you read uh, catechisms, uh, various catechisms, whether it be the Westminster uh, uh, Confession of Faith or, or others, so it would say something similar to this. So this is not really uh, out of step at this, at this point or out of step at all. Um, it's Balthazar Hoffman that will put a title page on uh, Weiss's catechism. And you can see uh, his writing here on the left. And I th uh, I'm just going to read the translation that uh, my colleague uh, uh, Grant uh, gave for us uh, from this catechism, uh, from this um, uh, beginning page, which reads, Christian catechism, questions on certain main points of Christian teaching and faith for the use and exercise of Christian youth, right? Thick book, right? It's for Christian youth. I wonder how they would do uh, today if we uh, all threw this uh, the, uh, to them at CE or whether it be confirmation. Anyway, for the use and the exercise of Christian youth and for instruction and service of Christian parents and house fathers so that their children receive and are guided by the exercise and learning, they themselves practice it and seek in such a way to make Christian theology known to them. Order and composed by George Weiss. And now reading further in uh, the preface. The knowledge of Christian doctrine and faith has departed such that also in knowledge, it is almost in a complete state of disrepair. In such a state of ignorance, some see God's turning us out of the old fatherland as punishment, and the fatherland being uh, uh, Silesia. Others see that God granted us such grace and offered us such a testament, thereby protecting us, and that it is therefore necessary for us on such a way of such unwillingness and ignorance to do something about it. And because there is no easier way to make a thing understandable than through question and answer, the questions provided by GW, as often um, uh, uh, summarizes them, George Weiss, are contained here. These questions contain all of orthodoxy and upright doctrine from God's wisdom and will with and because of the sanctification of humanity through Christ and the Holy Spirit, according to the contents of the Holy Scripture. And for a test of this method, and also as a witness to his will and diligence, he, that is George Weiss, practiced catechesis daily with the youth until 1740, every single day, uh, passing along questions and answers with the youth between 1734 and 1740. When on the 11th of March, God removed him from this meager life. And this is also the reason that some points have not yet been brought to conclusion. However, it also witnesses to the glorious gift that God gave him and the knowledge that he had of Christian doctrine and the Holy Scriptures, as well as the diligence that he devoted to them and the will and desire that he had that all might participate in them. And then he quotes Exodus uh, 12, 24 through 26, says uh, God's people came out of Israel uh, years ago. Um, uh, Hoffman um, views this as a, a, a good way to conclude this uh, preface. You shall observe this rite as a statue for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? And then it ends, uh, implying that, uh, well, it's the catechism. It's this um, uh, content uh, found in George uh, Weiss's uh, catechism that Balthasar Hoffman is passing along. So I think at this point, uh, you'll see this it's a pretty significant document uh, for Schwenkfelders as they come to America, what George Weiss is thinking, what he's passing along daily to the children that goes back to Caspar Weiss, that goes all the way back to Caspar Schwenkfeld. What's in this catechism? Well, it's a question and answer format, and you can maybe be able to see from the slide uh, here, and uh, bear with me, those of you who are on uh, Zoom, but uh, those of you here in, in present, um, uh, I'm just going to step to the side and show you where some of the questions are and where the answers are. The German word for question is frog, so here. That's the question, and it's about one line. And then underneath it is about a paragraph, which is the answer. About uh, the length of my hand. Those of you who are on a Zoom, you'll be able to see in the lower right-hand corner, you might be able to make out the word frock um, about halfway down the, the right-hand page there. And then the first line, uh, full line under it, uh, the question, and then uh, the answer for about a paragraph underneath it. 
most of these uh, uh, answers are about uh, a paragraph in length. Uh, some of them are just a few words, sometimes a sentence. Uh, sometimes uh, they're very uh, simple and straightforward. Other times they're in depth and uh, we'll just read some of those uh, in a moment. But it's a Socratic method. If you could imagine George Weiss uh, asking uh, uh, the children, they'll ask, he'll ask a question, he'll expect a, about a paragraph uh, answer uh, in, in return. What are the sections? It starts off with uh, creation where George Weiss has 261 questions about creation. And then he moves on to prayer, where there are 278 uh, questions about prayer, and that's the lengthiest section. He moves on to the Lord's Prayer of 259 questions, and then on to the Ten Commandments uh, and the Law for 136 questions. He then comes to the church, 131 questions, the Confession of Christ by Peter. You might remember the section in the scripture in Matthew 16. Who do you say that I am? And, and uh, Peter says, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of God. 64 questions on that. Baptism, 166 questions. And then the section we're going to look at today, the Lord's Supper, 271 questions about the Lord's Supper. It's the second lengthiest section within the catechism. And then he completes it with 88 questions on what marriage is. Now, before we look at this section on the Eucharist, let me uh, dial back uh, the time period here and let's uh, think about Caspar Schwenkfeld and his understanding of the Eucharist. And here referring to uh, several uh, brown bag uh, lunches earlier. I'm just going to do this uh, in a nutshell though, but it's important that we have Caspar's view in mind before we come and read George Weiss on it. At the time of the Reformation, uh, right before the Reformation, it is one view about um, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, and it is the viewpoint of transubstantiation. How many of you have heard of transubstantiation? Okay, about half, okay. Uh, transubstantiation, when the priest uh, holds the elements up and, has, and says uh, particular words about it, it turns into the actual body and the actual blood of Christ. That is the Catholic viewpoint at the time of uh, the Reformation, and it's only the ordained priest who can administer the elements. And it's at that special point uh, in the Eucharist where the ordained uh, priest holds up the elements. That's when the uh, what looks like the physical um, uh, bread and wine that actually turns in the mind of the of the ordained priest and in the viewpoint of the Catholic Church to the actual body and blood of Jesus. It is necessary for the Christian per to partake of these elements at the time of the Reformation for salvation. So it's very, very important uh, for, at, as uh, Caspar Schwenkfeld's talking about this in the time of the Reformation. You must partake of the Eucharist at the time of the Reformation to be considered a Christian. Now, I think I've summarized uh, uh, this uh, about uh, the turning of uh, uh, the bread and the wine. I should also note that union with Christ takes place at the eating of the elements from the Catholic perspective at the time of the Reformation. Any other viewpoint about uh, the Eucharist is considered heretical. But then comes along the Reformation. And there are four viewpoints, which I'm going to summarize very uh, briefly. The Lutheran, uh, one coming forth uh, first, instead of transubstantiation, it's consubstantiation. Instead of the bread and the wine turning into the actual body and blood of Jesus, it's the bread and the wine are surrounded by uh, the presence of Jesus. So that uh, this very famous uh, phrase is, is considered, it is in, it is with and under, but it is not actual. Okay, so it's all but uh, turned into uh, the uh, actual body and blood of Jesus at the time of uh, the um, at the time of uh, the taking of the Eucharist from the Lutheran perspective. So you've got transubstantiation. Now you have a second one, consubstantiation. Along comes Ulrich Zwingli, who says, "No, it's not about this at all. It's a memorial." It's not that the body, it's not that the bread turns into the body of Jesus, and it's not that the wine turns into the blood of Jesus, and it's not that there's a spiritual presence around it. The main thought from Zwingli is 
you're just supposed to remember that Jesus did this. That is the memorial view. So as you take of the bread and as you take of the cup, you're remembering what Jesus did on the night before in which he was betrayed. That's the Zwinglian view. There's a fourth viewpoint, and that is Calvin. This is a picture of John Calvin, where the symbol of the bread and wine, and wine allows one to get to the spiritual experience behind it. The sign and the thing uh, are signified, but are separate from the actual body and the actual blood of Jesus. So it's a spiritual experience that surrounds the entirety of the taking of the Eucharist. Not that it is in, with, and under uh, the bread and the cup, but it is the whole general type of experience as one draws close to the Lord himself during the time of partaking of the Eucharist. This is the category which uh, Schwenkfeld fits in, although he's going to add a distinctive that I think is important. So of the four, Schwenkfeld is not a transubstantiationist. He is not a consubstantiationist. He is not a memorialist. He is most like Calvin, but then he's going to add a specific distinction for he is going to focus on in partaking of the Eucharist, not only the spiritual experience like Calvin, but experiencing the glorified body of Christ through the Eucharist. So there's an extra element added to the partaking of the Eucharist so that one is thinking on the glorified Christ. How does he come to this idea? He merges John 6 with the words of institution. I'm sure you've heard of these verses. Uh, I know a number of you are part of the Schwenkfelder Church. I'm sure you've heard these verses used at uh, the partaking of the Eucharist um, of the Lord's Supper in the Schwenkfelder denomination. John 6, 35, where Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. And as, he, as uh, Schwenkfeld thinks on this bread of life, he uh, places this in line with the words of institution from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, John 6, now with this is my body, 1 Corinthians 11. That's how you reach the Schwenkfeld viewpoint, although it's not necessarily out of step with many other viewpoints either, but Schwenkfeld will uh, specifically focus on this bread of life and how it is become glorified. That is his unique contribution. He will then translate, this is my body and think of it like this. My body is this namely food because he's a spiritualist wanting the uh, partaker of the Eucharist to think on heavenly things. So the focus is on partaking of the glorified body of Christ, which is a spiritual experience. All right, now back to George Weiss. And uh, let's uh, get to uh, an overview of this section in his catechism. And then I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, Grant Gebby for a few minutes to talk about translation. And then we'll read some of the translations that he's done. Overall, we're looking at 271 questions uh, within this um, investigation of uh, the Eucharist in George Weiss's uh, catechism. He refers to Jesus Christ a hundred times uh, specifically, explicitly. Uh, likely more, but uh, just uh, doing a search on the translation, it's at least a hundred times within this section. Some of the questions and answers you'll see are obvious. Um, but then uh, as George Weiss probes the depth of the Eucharist, you're going to find many, many deeper things within his uh, understanding uh, of the Eucharist, uh, some which fit, fit very well into uh, Reformed thought at that time, uh, some uh, which uh, also illustrate a particular Schwenkfeldian interest. So at this point in time, I'd like to see if uh, we could switch over to uh, Grant, uh, Gabby, just to say a few words about uh, the translation experience and uh, your translation work, um, uh, Grant, on a, a dynamic uh, translation of uh, George Weiss's um, writing. Is it possible to switch over to Grant right now? 
Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Are you able to hear me now, Drake? Okay, we can barely hear you in here. Okay. Okay, well, let me try and speak up if I can. Are you, am I coming across okay? Uh, it's still fairly weak. Can we say oh, that? Dear. It's better, but it's a little weak, Grant. Okay, I wonder if I can take my microphone any closer. Uh, yeah. Well, let me try and keep as close to the microphone as possible. Can you can you hear me in? Can you hear me any better now, Drake? Uh, it's still pretty faint, Grant. Uh, do you sorry. want to try and work on it a little bit later? Have you at the end of the presentation? I I don't know how I'm going to improve on it at all. Uh, Oh, it's fine. Um, on Zoom. Okay. John says that I'm clear on here. Zoom. Grant, can you say something again? I'm trying to play with the volume here. Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll say a few meaningless sentences. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I figured out the problem. Um, okay. But. I can't see if I can fix it without stopping Zoom. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. If I stop this, hold on one moment here. No, it's on the right thing. Let's turn it up. Oh. Can you say something now? Yes, okay. I'll try and I'll try and say something comprehensible. <laughs> We're just gonna have to listen really carefully in here. I think it's gonna be better on Zoom oh. if you later listen to the tape recording. Oh really? Oh dear. I am sorry. <laughs> if you think there's anything else I can do to improve, then please just let me know. But it is a, it's a great pleasure to be with you all uh, today and to be working together with Drake on this project. And thank you to Drake for what he's already given us this afternoon. I've been learning from that. <laughs> So there are a number of things I'd like to uh, point to. Drake has been commenting on the, um, the catechism already, and I want to just highlight one question where Vice asked the question, which creations did the Lord use for his institution? Well, he, he uses this word creation. I call it creation. It is actually the German word kreatur, and I suppose you could translate that as a creature, but it's simply a physical element that he's asking about. He's asking, which elements are we talking about? And so we're talking about the bread and the wine. And his answer, he, he always provides a nice long answer, and his answer is he uses two creations, namely, bread and wine, which because of their usefulness, power and effect are to be counted among the noblest creations and therefore serve the Lord in his acts in a most fitting way. So this is maybe I'm hoping you can already get a flavor of, of vice language. The second point I want to make is that vice always has a tripart, tripartite thinking in his writing. And I'm going to give you an example of that in question 24. He, he asked the question, which form did these creations take 
when they were used by the Lord for his mystery. And he, in, his, in his answer, he says, it was in that they are used by people for their own needs, just as God has made them, completely according to the natural order. Bread comes from grain, seed, or wheat, which is threshed, milled, and baked, and therefore thereby prepared to be nourishing bread. Similarly, wine is, is according to the same natural order, pressed from the grapes to be a delicious drink. And so Vice simply talks about the way bread has been made, and he makes spiritual conclusions from that. And he likewise talks about the wine being made from grapes, and he takes parallels from that to the spiritual, the spiritual life. Okay, so that, that is interesting. In questions 31 to 36, he has a long section where he asks, where he brings up the whole subject matter of mystery in the Lord's coming, in regard to the Lord's coming. And then he talks about the wine in regards to the Lord's coming. Each time he gives three long good answers. And so let me just um, find the right place where uh, question 31, he, he, he basically answers each of his questions incredibly thoroughly. So there are three main answers to the section on the bread in terms of the Lord's coming. And each question is subdivided into three sections. And he seems to have, he seems to be at pain to, at pains to actually come up with the best and, and most um, thorough answers that he can. Well, let me go on a little bit further now. Question 37, he, he talks about um, comparisons. This word comparison is something that I struggled with quite a lot to give a good translation. And it's actually the German word for Goliath, but actually he's simply wanting to give examples. So he's not making a direct comparison to something. He's simply giving what you and I would call an example, but I think that it's simply an 18th century word for, let's talk about some examples here. And so he compares the bread to lots of spiritual outcomes. Let's go on to question 40. This is quite an interesting section. I know Drake has been fascinated about this section as well, which talks about the wine in relation to the mystery of the Lord in, in relation to his custom and effect. And it's almost like, what does the wine, how does the wine relate to the mystery of the, what the Lord wants to actually do in the outcome of the wine. And so then he goes through, similarly, three types of questions. Um, and he goes into great detail. Let's just say that. Grant, I'm, I'm gonna have some of those uh, slides that I can put up uh, on, the, on the projector. I think that would be helpful uh, for us to look at those together okay. uh, when we reach there. Um, do you have any, uh, things that you might want to share about uh, your experience of uh, working through uh, uh, George Weiss's German at this point in time? Sure. I mean, I can, I can simply say that it is relatively easy to understand. It is far easier to understand his German than um, Schwenkfeld's German. We're talking 200 years of difference, aren't we? Um, mm -hmm. But his sentence structure is extremely long. His whole uh, punctuation is very different from 
the one that you and I would be more accustomed with nowadays. And so um, his typical sentence is between 60 and 80 words long. And so one of my, one of my um, challenges is to try and make his, his language easy to understand because, you know, if I'm reading word number 70, am I still thinking of word number 10? Am I still connecting the whole sentence together? So sentence structure is, is a challenge. But when I'm reading all of this, I feel that he is enthusiastic. I can actually almost hear a preacher preaching something enthusiastically to me. And so when I'm, when I'm reading his writing, it's exciting to listen to, if yes. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, there's a, a pastor writing um, uh, explanation in detail for, uh, for those that are, that are listening. And I think, why don't we see if we can turn to some of the questions uh, uh, that I have on the slide so that we can keep everybody together on this. And then perhaps at the end, maybe you want to uh, round off uh, some of your own impressions uh, from each of, of, um, of uh, the questions that we've looked at, Grant. How, how's sure. that sound? Great, that's great. Okay, okay. All right, as you read through this uh, catechism, uh, be prepared for these things as you, um, as you do uh, reading. Christ will be seen as the Passover lamb in uh, Vice's interpretation. And we're going to see that the importance of the heart, very important, like Caspar Schwenkfeld's uh, viewpoint. Um, and then Vice is going to spend special attention, ironically, on the cup, which I think is really interesting because it was Schwenkfeld who put so much attention on the bread. Uh, I don't have a good reason for that at this point, but that is a notable. Um, Oh boy, can I move this slide along? There we go. Let's uh, start reading this section now on uh, the Eucharist. Some of these uh, first questions are very obvious. Who initiated Holy Communion? That, we should have that one. Jesus Christ, our dear Lord and Savior. That would be an easy one. Where did he do it? In the Holy City, Jerusalem, in an upper room which was unfurnished. Okay. When did he do it? The evening before his holy suffering. Who was he with when it happened? With his holy disciples, the 12 apostles. And you think, the children will get that. They'll certainly understand that. That's true. But then he will uh, quickly progress into something uh, deeper, where he will take the element, uh, uh, he will take the Eucharist, and they will relate Old and New Testament together. So now, as we look at uh, question 12, notice the Old Testament's involved with the Eucharist. And what do the differences between the sacraments of the Old and New Testaments actually consist? And the answer is this. The sacraments of the Old Testament showed symbolically what Christ would be to all believers in the future. However, the sacraments of the New Testament show in truth what Christ already is in the heart. And I've underlined uh, two uh, uh, phrases there. What Christ would be to all believers where the Old Testament, uh, which is concealed, is now revealed, using Augustine's language, um, Schwenkfeld would see it like that. We read the Old Testament, we read the New Testament, we see these two connected. George Weiss sees that also in the same way. But did you notice the last phrase at the end of this answer? What Christ already is in the heart. Uh, for those of you uh, from the Schwenkfelder Church, the spiritual experience of Christ, you can hear it in that last, uh, uh, in that last uh, uh, clause there in the answer in question 12. The performed aspect of uh, the Eucharist comes out very clearly in uh, question 13. What was actually the truth of the symbolic Passover lamb? Nothing other than Christ himself, just as John clearly witnesses, behold, the Lamb of God, which bears the sin of the world. What took place in the past at the Passover lamb now apply to Jesus uh, in the New Testament, um, fitting in line with Reformed thought in general, which you know, Schwenkel will be a part of that. Can a comparison be made in, these, in the short, shortest possible way? And Weiss would say this. After the feast of the symbolical Passover lamb, there was the exodus of the Jews out of Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea. 
after the feast of the spiritual Passover lamb, Christ Jesus, the exit of all Christians from this world will follow and the death of sin. So he's drawing the same, he's drawing from a picture in the Old Testament. What was in the Old Testament, somewhat concealed, is now revealed in the actual uh, partaking of the Eucharist in the New Testament times. And George Weiss continues that same uh, reform emphasis. He continues the Schwenkfeldian in the heart emphasis in something like question 16. Must therefore the truth of the symbolic Passover lamb come before the breaking of bread? And the answer is absolutely <laughs> from George Weiss. Uh, yes, we must uh, certainly appreciate it first uh, in the heart. The believers must have eaten and completely enjoyed the true Passover lamb, Christ Jesus, in their hearts and souls. So you see, I've emphasized that and underlined it then uh, too, a Schwenkfeldian interest. Only then can they deal with and use the institution of our Savior in the breaking of bread according to his sense and will to full use and truthfulness. Now just a few more questions and answers uh, from uh, Weiss's uh, catechism. Here we have the spiritual presence of Christ connected with the cup. And this is a, something that I haven't seen from Schwenkel, but I do see from George Weiss, and I think it's intriguing. In which ways did the wine contribute to the mystery of the Lord's coming? Answer, to list up all comparisons here might be going a bit too far, okay? So we might simply note a few, such as firstly, just as the physical wine has its origin and background in the physical vine is born of its juice and power. So the spiritual wine of the precious blood of Christ has its origin and background in the spiritual vine, Christ Jesus himself. It is the living juice of his transfigured flesh and glorified body fulfilled and shot through with the power of the high Godhead. Now, that is a power-packed paragraph there. And you might say, wow, that's really dense. Uh, it, it is. It is dense. But it's Weiss who's taken a lot of time to explore this and try and connect ideas uh, within the partaking of the cup that fit in line with other New Testament ideas. So let me just re read the underlined portion here again. So the spiritual wine of the precious bl blood of Christ has its origin and background in the spiritual vine. Remember that expression, I am the vine, right? John 15, verse 1. Uh, it, Schwenkfeld didn't put that together like this, but it's Weiss who's following John 6 ideas, right? I am the bread of life, now taking it to the bread. Now, I am the vine, I'm taking it to the cup. And that is Christ Jesus himself in his transfigured flesh and glorified body. Okay, that's, that's a very specific uh, development that has happened in George Weiss's uh, understanding of the Eucharist. Two more questions. Question 40. This is a long question. In which ways did the wine contribute to the mystery of the Lord according to his custom and effect? How did the wine contribute to the mystery of the Lord in relation to its custom and effect? I'll repeat it a second time. And a third time. And then we read further as an answer. Just as the physical wine saves the person suffering thirst from his plight, by quenching and satisfying his thirst, otherwise he might die. In the same way, the spiritual wine, the blood of Christ removes, extinguishes, and satisfies the soul of its inner and spiritual thirst, which it inherited from Adam. Under this circumstance, it would have had to suffer, be ruined, and perish the eternal, uh, the eternal death. Okay, once again, a very full, explanation, uh, quite robust in his answer. But you can think of uh, the satisf satisfaction of the soul, uh, inner and spiritual thirst. Once again, Schwenkfeldian uh, uh, interests here, which it inherited from Adam. Uh, you can hear the, the spiritual depravity in man that needs to be satisfied in some way. And Weiss sees this taking place as the Christian partakes of the Eucharist in a spiritual way experiencing Christ, who is the true vine. Okay, so you have a sampling now of some of the 271 questions, uh, some very simple, some uh, connecting uh, ideas that other reformers at the time would have, and then some that uh, truly bring on a Schwenkfeldian, um, take a Schwenkfeldian emphasis. So let's see if we can summarize. 
advice about Christ in the Eucharist? The most important thing is that Christ is appreciated in the heart and soul of the Christian as the Christian partakes, uh, following a very Schwenkfeldian uh, line. But he sees Christ purifying and cleansing the one as he or she partakes. And it's then, uh, we didn't read uh, these uh, questions, um, but we could have. Once one has taken of communion of the Eucharist, it's Christ within, within the heart that in encourages the communicant to love other people and do good acts of service. So it's all related according to uh, vice. Um, not only do we partake, but we are nourished and then hence uh, we serve and bless others as a result. Okay, I don't think I'm going to go on this slide. We'll just go a little bit further here and let you ask some questions few notable points uh, where Weiss and Schwenkfeld agree and disagree. Weiss, like Schwenkfeld, continues the pattern of being a spiritualist like Calvin in his description of the Eucharist. So he hasn't deviated substantially from the Reformed perspective at that time, but he does put aside celestial flesh, which was so significant in Schwenkfeld's uh, writing about um, uh, the Eucharist. We do not see that in uh, the 271 questions in Weiss's catechism. This is discontinued. But Weiss uh, pays much more attention to the cup and wine than Schwenkfeld, who spends much of his time on the body and bread. Uh, and unlike Schwenkfeld, he does speak uh, somewhat about a glorified blood, although he won't use the exact same language. A few other conclusions that we can draw from this, uh, backing away now from the uh, nitty gritty of the, of the, uh, the Eucharist itself. Uh, Schwankfelders at the time of Weiss were not memorials. They were not consubstantiationists. Ooh, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? And they also weren't transubstantiationists. They still continue with the spiritual presence of Christ. And it's the Eucharist and the Christian spiritual relationship with Christ that is dense and profound, uh, and it demanded much thought then and likely should for those who are part of this tradition today even if we don't come to exactly the same verbiage and conclusions. For further exploration, uh, exploration um, I know Grant and I are continuing on uh, with uh, the uh, translation and evaluation of the Weiss Catechism, the relationship of George Weiss to other catechisms at this time uh, with the Eucharist, I think would be intriguing to look at, such as uh, Christopher Schultz's uh, viewpoint on this. And then I think it also would be interesting to see how this viewpoint of the Eucharist corresponds with other religious groups uh, that were settling in Pennsylvania in the 1730s. And with that, we'll stop uh, this presentation and allow you to ask a few questions uh, or maybe have a few comments. Thank you for listening. Yeah, my father has a first question, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm wondering with um, what seems to be profound thought and thinking about the, the communion how he felt about continuing the snowstorm, which started, of course, during Schweinfeld's life, yeah. and certainly well continued in the 1700s, or even in the 1800s, yeah. when they finally got away with it. Yeah. Did he ever express himself on that, or maybe you don't know? I didn't see it in the in the translation. Grant, did you see anything? Great, uh, can, that you, um, to can you restate the, state the question? Yes, I can. Uh, that, that, um, my father asked a very good, good question. Um, uh, tell me if I'm summarizing right. That um, uh, what did George Weiss say about uh, about the still sound? Um, do we have anything in the in the, the translation of his catechism? I can't remember anything. Grant, does anything come out uh, from the still stand, uh in in uh, the translation of the catechism? I don't honestly think so, Drake. I really can't bring anything to mind. No, so uh, neither of uh, neither of uh, saw anything about the still stand. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 an important thing to point out. Question uh, coming through the chat: Will the entire? Oh, let's just read it here. Will the entire catechism in English be published? Uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll get to that point. So uh, we're still a number of questions uh, and answers uh, away, but. Uh, uh, Maybe I could throw this out to, to this uh, group. Um, we do have uh, uh, some of the, uh, we do have this one section um, uh, that we're working on. Would it be helpful to release some of it in a section to read? Would that be of interest? 
We're going to start working through it in the, the uh, Schwenkfelder Ministerium, but uh, if that would be an interest, maybe you could let me know um, at some point um, after this presentation. Another comment or a question on the, the George Weiss Eucharist uh, discussion. There are whole books written about uh, Roman Catholicism and the Eucharist, as well as about uh, consubstantiationists uh, from uh, the Lutheran tradition. This is not uh, too far out of field, although it might seem to be quite dense and quite deep. Um, yes, please. Um, do you feel as though Weiss completed what he wanted to do in his in catechism. I mean, it, it seems as though he died suddenly. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. I mean, someone was, from our point of view, fairly young. Did he complete it? I think he com completed most of it. Um, I mean, looking at sections uh, in comparison with other catechisms, uh, yeah, they, they do have comments on uh, the Ten Commandments. They do have comments on prayer, the Lord's Prayer, uh, covenant, mm -hmm. creation. Um, a lot of those are still covered. Um, I haven't seen, a, uh, frequently uh, catechism, catechisms will end with a discussion of the end times. I don't have that here. Could he have had something on that? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating. Uh, would he have wanted to add it? Um, maybe, but frequently catechisms end like that, and it's it, it, this one doesn't end like that. So, so it, it leads us to believe, and then some of the introduction leads us to believe that uh, maybe he would have wanted to add a few few other things. Um, how much? I don't know. Do you have a comment on that at all, Grant? Well, the only thing the only thing I can think of is that actually a lot of the discussion of the Lord's Supper actually talks about the end times. It does. relates to the Lord's second coming. And, you know, it's all this parallelism that's going on in his mind. On the one hand, Christ came to the earth, but on the other hand, he is coming again. And that, that does come through in some of the comments on the bread and the wine. So... I don't know. Maybe, maybe he thinks it's been covered. Yeah, per perhaps, yeah. Mm -hmm. But not in a full section like other catechisms. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That, is, that is something that's really worth looking into. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Do you have any final word you want to give, Grant? Well, is it okay just to try and say a few things? I mean, the, the first thing that I would like to point you in the direction of is looking at one thing that he highlights that is absolutely fascinating, which is talking about the actual Lord's Supper, the, the, the final supper with the disciples, and then the day of death, the day of Christ's crucifixion, which is presumably 24 hours later. Now, Weiss spends a lot of time talking about this period of 24 hours, you know, at the, at the Lord's Supper, at the actual, um, you know, the breaking of the, the real bread and the breaking of the wine. He, he knows that he is he's only doing something symbolical. He's looking forward or he's preempting the death of Christ. And this is something that is really comes over very powerfully when you read the catechism. It is absolutely fun. It is fascinating the way he, he goes into it. So that's something that readers can maybe look out for and ask themselves why, I guess. Okay. I mean, yeah. 
I think a few a few of the other things I've also mentioned, but one thing I'd like to kind of talk about is simply question 79. If if you I can I can bring up question 79. And it's the whole idea of enjoyment. Um, when we go to communion, do we realize that we are at something which is very enjoyable? <laughs> uh, Vice asked the question, did the disciples enjoy the body of Christ? I've never asked myself this question. And the answer, he says, is yes, just as they ate natural bread with their mouths, likewise, they enjoyed the body of Christ in their souls as a spiritual and life-giving food. And then he goes into many other aspects of enjoyment. It is, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, how do you enjoy bread? How do you enjoy wine how do you enjoy drinking wine and this has a parallel a spiritual parallel each time it is it's exciting to read and uh, i think there there's a lot of interesting questions that can be raised thank you very much it's been great to participate this afternoon thank you grant uh, for uh, for joining us from scotland and uh, also for your thoughts and involvement in this project so. I think we'll call it uh, like that. Uh, thank you for your attention today. And uh, uh, yes, I hope that uh, uh, this has been uh, helpful in thinking through uh, the Eucharist and also through Schwenkfelder tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Greg and Grant both.